Hello everyone, it's Sylvia from Fela Tarot. Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to have a look at how to build a tarot mandala with the help of a crystal grid. First of all, I wanted to talk about the decks that we're going to use and uh, one central deck uh, that we're going to have a, uh, a look at is the Crystal Grid Oracle. Uh, this is the Deluxe Edition uh, by Nicola McIntosh and it's a rock pool uh, publication release um, because it is a Deluxe Edition. Uh, this is the typical your typical rock pool Deluxe Edition so it's a, um, uh, a box um, not even a magnetic box but it's kind of nice because it folds this way um, I have to say they're getting um, really good with the, the production value at Rockpool but then again I last week I saw a new oracle which hasn't even been released in Australia yet and I was uh, just portraying one of the uh, um, channels from the US and it was a rock pool release and I looked at it and it was absolutely terrible. So even the, uh, the guide book was just, it really looked like, um, you know, pieces of, of photocopied paper held together by a string. And it, the cards were only 24 for an oracle, which is, you're really pushing it. 24 cards is, I mean, if you sell it at $24, it's a dollar for a card, which, you know, it sounds a bit expensive. So I'm not sure what's going to happen. So there is, uh, in a couple of weeks time, there will be Mind, Body, uh, Spirit Festival in Sydney. And uh, Rockwell has got a um, annual tradition of uh, showing up at these events. And uh, the uh, I know by experience that the girls at Rockwell, at least the ones that I've met uh, during the years at this festival, they are absolutely lovely. They answer all of your questions. Therefore, I'm, I'm actually going to talk to them. I'm actually going to, you know, ask them what the uh, company is thinking, what the feature is. Um, we're going to have a couple of interviews, hopefully on camera. Otherwise, it will be not on camera, but I will still you know, um, uh, interview them and, and then relate back to you what the answers were. Because I think that there's a lot to talk about, especially with publishers, not just with creators. We hear the creator side all the time, especially when it comes to issues related to AI generated art, for example. But I really want to hear, for once, I want to hear what a publisher thinks about these new decks that are inflating let's say the kickstarter market at the moment or in the past at least in the past 18 months let's talk about the crystal grid oracle um though so this is the deluxe edition originally this deck came with a lot a lot less cards i don't remember specific i think it was probably 30 40 cards um 36 new cards. So it came with 36 cards. There's new, uh, there's 36 new cards. So now we've got 72 cards. Um, it's finally, it's a very chunky deck. Although I have to say that compared to the um, quality of the cardstock of the non deluxe edition, so only the 36 cards, this one, um, okay. It's got a really nice matte gold gilding uh, which unfortunately though I can see already it's uh, it's a bit chipped I have been using this deck a fair bit but it doesn't really justify I've only had it for a week so even if I used it every day it doesn't really justify all of the corners being chipped already such a pity because this is the kind of matte gold edging that generally speaking doesn't necessarily scratch your fingers when you use it um, in any case, it might it might have come this way. I actually did not pay attention to it. So, uh, what I did want to say is this: that he, it's the cardstock is slightly thinner. It's got a really good bounce and a very good tactile feel to it. It's a matte stock cardstock, matte finish. It's one of those really good um, papery kind of uh, tactile feel to the decks that actually produces a kind of nice friction noise when you uh, do like that with the cards. And, and just another example that comes to mind would be the Amber and Aura Tarot from uh, Jamie Richardson. Although that one is a, a step up in quality, but this is going into that direction. I have to say that for 20 
six dollars Australian I think I, I spent um, you know the overall 72 cards with a chunky monkey of a book um, in full color as you can see and uh, that nice box I mean we're, we're getting that for sure I, I actually think that you know it's a really good deal for 26 Australian it's a really really good deal in any case so this deck is about as you can imagine it's about crystal grids so it's an oracle card that gives you for each and every card it gives you a um, main uh, uh, crystal uh, so for example card 49 is ammonite and then it's associating the um, crystal with a keyword in this case is creation but it also gives you this crystal grid uh, which is um, an original photo um, with a, a few manipulations as you can see in the background for example but this starts from an original photo uh, so we've got the septarian the rose quartz generator with love we've got the tech titan ulex site with release hakima diamond with clarity smithsonite with truth um and so on and so forth some of these i have never heard about some of these i can't even pronounce as you can see well, we got red jasper, I know about that one. Uh, watermelon tourmaline, tourmaline, quartz stalactite, and so on and so forth. So as I said, there's 72 cards. So as you can imagine, I don't know, honestly do not know 72 crystals. I probably know only about a dozen. So I am in no way <laughs> an expert on crystals and crystal therapy. I am... Um, it, it's something that I don't know enough of to be able to tell you whether I um, I want to practice crystal therapy or not. Um, I do know uh, for many years I've known the properties of rose quartz uh, because I was actually gifted one by a really close friend of mine when I left the Netherlands and I came to Australia. So she gave me a rose quartz to keep with me because um, it would she explained to me that it would have protected my heart. And um, truth be told, I never take it off. I was wearing it in a, a chain around my neck and I never took it off during my all of my travels. Uh, I did eventually end up taking it off simply because the chain broke after a few years, um, even though I was really making sure, you know, not to ruin it. And, um, but it, it was pretty, but the, the rock, the um, the quartz is still intact and I still have it and I had to, you know, I, I actually watched videos on how to clean it, on how to recharge it, how to purify it and so on. And it was very interesting. But at that time, I really realized that there is so much to know about crystal therapy and crystals in general that I simply did not have any kind of energy at that point to invest in any kind of uh, study of the matter and I just didn't want to do things halfway half-baked and so I just decided to step back and I trust that if one day I will feel the need to know more about crystals I will have the time and I will have the resources to do that for the time being I don't necessarily do and it's you know it's just life getting in the way all the time um, what I do like, um, though, in uh, when it comes to crystals is um, the grids. They are very aesthetically very pleasing. And I actually know about the energy that is supposed to be represented by crystals. You're literally manifesting something depending on which crystal you use as a centerpiece of the crystal grid. Uh, you will have, let's say, a different kind of energies at play in the grid itself. When I saw this deck, I reached out for it and um, I uh, knew about the original deck that only had 36 cards. I was not interested in that one, even though it would have been easier for me to use it because 36 is an easier number to memorize rather than 72, obviously. But when I saw the uh, deluxe uh, production and especially when it comes to the book and what they talk about in the book, um, I decided to give it a go, especially because I realized that there's a lot in the book that could be used 
could help you use this oracle as an oracle that can not necessarily just by looking at the energy of the crystals. So if you are not interested in crystals, um, but you still want a really good oracle, this is actually something that you can use um because of you know it's obviously talking about crystals and crystal grids but the color palette is really amazing and uh, it actually pairs well with a lot of decks there's also a few tarot decks that have uh, that replaced the suit of pentacles with the suit of crystals um you know referring back to the element of earth so those decks for example would be quite interesting to see them at play with this oracle in a combination but the reason why I'm talking about it today is because I realized by reading through the book, as I always do, that this is actually a really good exercise when you want to build a tarot mandala. Um, so as a disclaimer, as I said at the beginning, I do not know enough to talk about crystal therapy. I uh, would not even know how to do a crystal grid in the sense that I would know what looks pleasing but I don't necessarily know the energies that are uh, represented by which crystal and therefore I am in no way qualified to build a crystal grid. I can look at them of course and I can study them with the book. Um, what I wanted to associate, the reason why I wanted to associate Terra Mandalas to a crystal grid is because Terra Mandalas are not a very simple kind of exercise. Um, however, and, and there's no guiding, there is absolutely no guiding. There is a little bit, um, Rachel Pollack talks about it in her 78 Degrees of Wisdom book uh, towards the end. Uh, depending on the edition, I remember in mine is page 312, but it could be a different page, obviously, depending on the edition. But she's um, explaining that tarot mandalas have the function, or you can use them, uh, to reverse, for example, or to create some kind of a protection out of a reading that did not necessarily convey good or positive energies. So when you find a five of swords, when you find a ten of swords, when you find a nine of swords or a tower, you can actually uh, build a tarot mandala using different cards that are at the opposite of the spectrum of those negative or, you know, substantially negative cards. And therefore you um, manifest this kind of uh, protection um, out of, of the mandala. But that is not an easy exercise, especially because first and foremost, you need to know the tarot correspondences, which is something that not everyone does. You need to know, for example, what counters the energy of the Five of Swords. And it, it, there's a number of things that um, you, know, you need to know before you start building a tarot mandala in that way, for that purpose. I also know that uh, Benabel Wen, for example, talks about in one of her blogs in a website about how to build a tarot mandala. But like everything uh, Benabel does, it's so really rich of knowledge that um, it also it feels a bit daunting. It feels a bit overwhelming um, when you just uh, want to start something fresh. You want to start something with the knowledge of the beginner. So what I'm going to show you today is a beginner's way uh, to build a tarot mandala thanks to the help of the crystal grid oracle. Let's have a look. So um, let's start with making some room because as you can tell, I'm going to need uh, a bit of room here, a bit of space. And that depends on the fact that obviously we are going to um, put as many cards down as we feel like we need to. So I'm just going to clear this table as much as possible. And let me tell you, it's just a very interesting exercise to do either when you don't necessarily know, um, you don't necessarily have an intention, let's say. It's a very good exercise to, first of all, to get to know, for example, the crystals, because you get to see them, you get to read what they are and associate them with the photo image. Um, but you also get to associate a keyword with the crystal. So, you know, by using this deck, even if it's for a different purpose, you will end up knowing a little bit more or gathering knowledge every time. Now, this is a chunky deck. So uh, the way I'm going to do it, I'm just going to shuffle it and I'm going to pick randomly a card out of this 72 cards deck. And then we're going to have a look at how 
I will build a Tara Mandala according to the aesthetics of the crystal grid. Now, obviously, if you know, if you're an expert on crystal grids, my apologies, uh, because you, you probably think that it's not the right way to use crystal grill, crisps. And I absolutely believe you and I agree with you 100%. However, this is also um, Rockpool, let's say it's doing exactly this. So Rockpool is indeed proposing using crystal grids as an oracle. So it's not exactly 100% the intention of using uh, crystals uh, this way. And there is nothing, let's say, I do not diminish at all the power of crystals. I simply, as I said at the beginning of the video, I do not know enough. And therefore, I feel like um, this could be a very fun way to actually bond with the stack. And at the same time, teach myself a few things about crystals. As you could see, I had some struggle um, Shuffling the cards, it is a rather large and chunky, especially that's it's it's standard oracle size size, I would say. Definitely the um it reminds me a lot of the uh Celtic um wisdom oracle because it, it also has the same consistency or the Celtic wisdom, also by Rockball. Uh but it is much chunkier than anything else that I have from Rockball, and therefore it feels like it's a bit um difficult to shuffle. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to pick a card. Uh, I can't really find because it's very slippery. It's varnished wood, so. But I'm just going to pick a card at random. And see what this card is. Okay, so we've got the turquoise with wisdom. As you can see, there's already a lot of um, information in the card itself. You've got, of course, you've got the name of the main crystal that we're talking about, so turquoise, uh, which is obviously in the center and on the size, uh, sides, but there's immediately a word associated, or a keyword associated with it, so the wisdom, referring back to the energy of the crystal, I imagine. But there's also a stag here, for example, and there's also a feather, and so and there's also some birds migrating, or it looks like they are migrating. What I like is that it creates a story. So you're not just presented with a few stones or a few crystals in a grid, you're actually presented with a, um, a gateway for um, some intuition from your part. So why is the stag here? Is that a wise animal for sure? Stags and owls are recognized for their wisdom. So it is an association that I myself have no problems with. You've got the feather. So the feather could represent, for example, the energy of the air. So that reminds me of something related to the mind rather than the body of the spirit. And then obviously we've got this um, um obviously the, the the i think these are selenite ones my apologies again if i mispronounce some of the names of the crystals or if i mistake some of the crystals for others it's not my intention to say anything wrong as a matter of fact i'm just going to go straight to the books and have a look at card number 41 as you can see here in the number so we've got wisdom turquoise wisdom protection power Turquoise, oh, there you go. I already made a mistake. So it's turquoise, yep, adventuring, quartz, Herkimer diamond. So these are Herkimer diamonds, obviously. This is the turquoise. The adventuring, I think, is these ones, but again, correct me if I'm wrong, because I could be completely wrong. Herkimer diamond, yeah, we saw them, and quartz, quartz is probably these ones. Um, so there you go, I already made a mistake. In any case, this is what we've got here. We've got turquoise adventure in quartz of Herkimer diamond. So it says in the book, turquoise has been worn for centuries as a symbol of wisdom and protection. It can display stunning blues to blue, green, and yellow green, and is usually accepted by another host rock flowing through it. The striking blue comes from copper within the stone, which is accompanied by aluminum, while other shades indicate there are other minerals within the turquoise. So you've got a little bit of the description of this specific crystal, which is always very interesting. As a matter of fact, I remember I was uh, driving down from 
Santa Fe, I think, to Las Cruces in New Mexico a few years ago. And uh, along the road, I think it was even called the Turquoise Road, or the, uh, you know, um, I think it was the Turquoise Road. But you have a lot of uh, shops or, you know, stalls that were selling turquoise. I stopped at a few of them, but to be honest with you, I have no com competence in knowing or in being able to tell which ones are real and which ones are fake. And I thought... Um, I had been reading about the fact that there are a lot of fakes being sold as real uh, with high prices so that would not have been necessarily a sign to tell them apart so I didn't buy anything. I kind of regret it now because I really would have wanted to but I'd rather not buy it. If, so, if, if I'm not sure that something is genuine I'd rather not buy it. So um, then it talks about um you know your relationship with the crystal and the power and the energies related to the crystal itself so it is time to listen to the wisdom within your soul or for someone who carries knowledge from years of living on this plane wisdom is gained through life experiences and from situations you go through in order to learn something valuable you will keep repeating patterns until a lesson is learned so you must ask yourself what you need to learn from what is being presented now this plane of existence is one big hologram to grow from, which means that things are not happening to you, but are happening for you. Now, this part I really like because it's something that can actually be extrapolated out of whether you have knowledge of crystals or not. This is something that is very helpful. And uh, this is giving me um, a little bit of an idea on how to build my Tara Mandala. So we're talking about wisdom, but we're also talking about repeating patterns that are not working for us. And so we need to identify those patterns and then stop going down the same track if we want different results. And then, you know, at the end, things are not happening to us, but they are happening for us. So make things happen for yourself and not to yourself see every different every situation with a different angle and understand that can occur so you can grow this is a really interesting uh, part and you will see other uh, crystal other cards will have exactly the same uh, some could be more inspiring than others i'm not well there you go inspiration is probably <laughs> an inspiring card uh, i'm not saying that each and every card of these will actually be working uh, but this one I really like. I like the, the word wisdom. I like the representation of the card. I like turquoises in general. So I'm actually going to start to build my mandala from this card. Let's have a look at how I do it. Now, the first act that I want to use uh, to build a mandala from with this uh, oracle is the Meraki Tarot. This is the third edition. Um, now, I presented this deck a couple of videos ago. The main differences are that it's a rather softer kind of image. Um, they changed also the font of the titles, which makes them actually more readable, easier to uh, read. And the cardstock is slightly thinner, which means that it's actually easier to fan out as a deck and the cards don't stick together as much as they used to in the second edition, uh, even though they still retain that really silky kind of rose petal feel to them. Overall, I when I got this deck the first time, I opened it, I looked at it, and I was so used to the sharpness, let's say, and the vibrant colors of the second edition that I looked at this one and I thought to myself that I don't want it, I don't like it, I'm going to rehome re it straight away. But then, especially these cards where there's a lot of darker colors, if you remember the second edition, you will see how different this is. Although a few of you commented that, um, sorry, there's a spider there, that um, through the camera, um, it actually looks sharper, not softer. That's a uh, that's a problem with my iPhone or any iPhone. So iPhones, when you unless you use a raw uh, app, and in that case, I would really want to verify whether it's really raw or an idea of an approximation of a raw file, a raw format. But if you use the normal camera uh, or the normal app for taking a video, uh, that's already when there's a transformation into JPEG. There's already an application of white balance, for example. Uh, sharpening and all sorts of things that um, normally do not happen when you take raw files. 
so there will be a sharpening the way in which it look even i myself right now i'm looking through the camera at the card and then i'm looking at the, the card directly and i can tell you that it's being sharpened by the lens in any case um it, it doesn't really matter it's um if you have it in your hands you you will see the difference I have been working with this stack simply because I wanted to give it a second chance and I actually find that it's got a completely different energy than the, the, the previous stack, the second edition. And I don't know whether it's due to the fact that there are there is this uh, change in the softness of uh, the figures and the, um, the colors and the especially on the lines on the edges of the uh, elements present in the cards. Perhaps it's due to that. Uh, certainly this card uh, looks a lot more soft than the original first and second edition. I really do appreciate the changing font because it is easier to read it. And look at this, I can actually go through the card one by one I, and I assure you, you could not have done something like this in the second edition because they would have been sticking together all the time. So I'm actually very grateful because of that and I, I don't mind it. So this is the first one that I want to pair up with the uh, well this particular Oracle card because this deck is crystal heavy. So what I mean is that the entire Suto Pentacles has been replaced with uh, crystals, but not just that. There's other cards uh, from the Major Arcana, for example, one that comes to mind is the Fool, but of course now I will never find it. But in any case, so the Fool card, for example, has got uh, some... And, uh, some crystals and other cards as well so whether you got no, no, still pentacles so uh, card, even cards that do not belong to the suit of pentacles will still have crystals in them and uh, that's an association that is actually kind of interesting uh, because it refers back as i said before to the element of earth um, which is obviously you know the element of crystals so how do I do this? Let me just shuffle this first and foremost. So what I want to see here, uh, we're talking about wisdom, we're talking about patterns that keep on repeating that are not serving us and how to see them in a different way. So apply the wisdom of the experience to see them in a different way, in such a way that now they actually serve us, they, they, they become useful. To us so we see here that we got a central card and then we got uh, sorry a central uh, crystal so the turquoise and then we got one two three and four main uh, let's say notes uh, on the crystal grid and then obviously we have all of the uh, surrounding ones now I'm not gonna put down as many cards as a crystal there are in this card because I, uh, I don't have enough room if you want to of course you can if you have enough room uh, what I will do though, I will uh, definitely pick five cards. So this one I will just, for now, I'll just move it here on the side because I still need it to have a look at it, but this is the center of the action. And let's see if I can find a card that will tell me a pattern. So at the center, I want to individuate, I want to find out what is this pattern that I keep on repeating where I'm not supplying my wisdom because I haven't, I haven't changed anything, but I still expect things to go in a different way. So, okay, this may look weird the way in which I'm choosing a card, but I'm just going through it uh, until I feel that I want to pick a card. This one. Okay, so um, as, as always, um, but if you watch my channel, you'll know there are no sample readings with me. It's every time it's like, Yep, you channel your own energy. <laughs> so the Ten of Cups, this is a pattern that I keep on repeating. Let me just be blunt. It's a Ten of Cup reverse. Okay. I um I have to I have no shame. <laughs> um I have no problems in admitting that. I struggle my whole life with the concept of family and unity in the family and community. Um, because I didn't have the experience of, of growing up in a, in a tight family. 
um, there was always, you know, someone very, very sick. My mom was someone very distant and also sick, my dad, and someone who was coming by and, and helping me, my auntie. So there's always been a lot of um, outsiders, for example, coming and taking care and trying to take care of the situation, uh, stepping in and not really doing much. Uh, if anything, they actually created even more confusion. So um, I've always struggled with this concept. I remember once there was this friend of mine, she was saying that um, she, so her family, on the contrary, was the Ten of Cups um, upright. And I just loved that. And she had a brother that she loved so much and a mom and a dad and, and a couple of uncles and, and aunties. And they were all together and were really, really happy and a really happy family. And I remember once I actually dreamed about her and her family. And in my dream, uh, she was showing me her hands and she was showing me her fingers. And for each and every finger, there was a member of her family. And I remember thinking that her family was complete. And then at that point, I looked back at my fingers and I was missing fingers. I only had one or one was only half. So that was a very clear, almost Freudian, I would say, <laughs> indication that A, I was jealous, of course. Uh, because I would have loved to have a family like that. But B, also that um, I obviously did not really know uh, how to relate to the concept of family. Because let me tell you, uh, once that I actually got to talk to her about that dream, she she started laughing and she told me, look, no, no, no family is perfect. It's uh, even something that looks perfect on the outside. It's actually very trouble sometimes in uh, in the inside. So the ten or cups reverse to me is the impossibility or the uh, conviction that I have on not being able to actually form or to achieve that kind of feeling of being part of belonging to a family. And uh, that's been a classic signature of many, many of my relationships with friends, with the relationship like with lovers and, and, uh, and with family itself when I had it. Um, so the, uh, this is telling me that um, I see it in reverse. So this is telling me that perhaps it is because I kept on going down the same path. I kept on doing things in the same way and expecting a different result, which is, you know, the epitome of not being very smart. <laughs> so this is telling me you need to the card that we saw, the card associated with the turquoise, which is wisdom. It's telling me that I need to look at things in a different perspective. So let's have a look at these four positions. So we identify what the patterns are that I keep on going down uh, on without obtaining the results that I want. So this is working against me. And how do I turn it upright in such a way that it will work for me? So again, I want to pick four cards this time. And these cards, just this, oh, I can't really... I should have picked a smaller deck, sorry about that, because now we're going to have a problem with space. But anyway, so we got Justice, we got the Seven of Wands, we got the Three of Cups, obviously. Sorry about that, it doesn't really fit, but in any case, you get the gist. Um, so you basically, you pull a card for each and every one of the main stones in the crystal grid, as you know, it's um, shown here. And there you go. And then you do a reading. So uh, we identify the Ten of Cups reverse. That's the pattern that I keep on um, not really looking at with wisdom, um, even after the experiences that I gained throughout my life. And therefore, this pattern keeps on failing me. It keeps on reminding me back and show, sending me back to the idea that I cannot really feel like I belong in a family. So how do I turn it um, the other way around? How do I change my perspective? First of all, we've got justice. The justice card is a card of confluence. Okay, it's a card of union. And I really like the way in which the uh, Meraki represents uh, this card because there's uh, two people, two persons. And uh, they, uh, they're they basically uh, joined at the, at the pinky, as you can see here, as if it were a promise, for example. But by doing that, they're actually sustaining, so they're actually uplifting and supporting um, the, uh, the two uh, traditional dishes 
uh, for weighing the right and the wrong that belong to as a symbol of justice. In this case, to me, it, it, it really shows the duality of the card as well. So it, it looks like this is telling me that I don't feel like I belong to a family because I never really accepted the consequences of a balance between a duality. It's always been rather me uh, feeling like I had to take more than the other person I was in a relationship with, for example. That not necessarily a romantic relationship, but it could have been a familiar relationship, a parental relationship, or you know, a community relationship or a friendship. Uh, but it feels like I probably could. I I had struggle. I had issues in understanding that the dishes need to be balanced. That's the meaning of justice. So look at justice in this way. Look at the relationship as something in which I bring something, but I also can get something out of it, as opposed to always me being the nine of wands and always carrying stuff by myself and, and being exhausted and still keep on going. Then we've got the seven of wands. Now the seven of wands to me represents the card that I feel I relate to most of the time when it comes to family, I want to stick to my guns. The seven of wands is feeling like you're the only one who's right and everyone else is against you. And when most of the time this actually has a very positive kind of meaning because it really um, is encouraging you to stick to your guns, to go ahead, not mind the others and defend yourself show resilience, etc. In this case, it may also be read in a reversed way. Why? Because I feel like these are the uh, stations or, you know, the positions that show me where I need to change my perspective in order to be able to reverse the Ten of Cups. So I probably need, where here in Justice, I need to be aware of the, the fact that it's a participation with equal measure between the person in a family. In here, I need to sometimes t take a step back, not always. Sometimes I may be right, but because I want to be supportive, I may have to be supportive rather than being right. You know when they say that the most important thing in a relationship for that to work is that you don't always have to be right, even when you are. Just concede sometimes, just to be able to love the other person, to show that you're open to, um, you're open to be fragile in front of them, and you're open to understand why they don't share the same opinion as you do. So perhaps instead of being one against everyone, I should try and listen to the others and see why they think the opposite of me. And then we've got the three of cups. Now, this is the growth of the family that um, is also something that I have been struggling with because it's not just the growth in the family or in the relationship, but the Three of Cups can also signify friendship. I have such an idealistic, very airy, very, <laughs> very Aquarius idea of a friendship that if it doesn't correspond to my idea of a friendship, it's, I automatically believe that it's not good enough. And not that it, I don't blame anyone else, I generally blame myself for it. So I should probably understand that, again, with the justice, I am showing that there's three cups and they're equally filled the same way. So I should probably understand that everyone has their own role in a relationship or in a community in order for the community to work. Everyone needs to bring whatever they can into this equation. And then the chariot. And the chariot card is the card that shows me that I should... This is one actually um, card that is resonating with the Seven of Wands. The Seven of Wands and the chariot also talk about overcoming obstacles, even though the Seven of Wands has that kind of fiery energy that doesn't really stop and thinking to think. The chariot does, because the chariot is one of the major arcana, so of course it brings with itself a lot more energy, a lot more as above rather than so below kind of energy. And it does show me the way. It shows me the fact that if I accept my role to be part of a community, if I accept that sometimes I don't and always have to be right, but sometimes I can be wrong, just to you know integrate and belong, and that if friendship doesn't have to be perfect to be actually working, then I will overcome all of these obstacles, see all of this in a different way, and be able to read this card or to see this card or to, to experience and live the Ten of Cups, so the community and the family, in its upright uh, meaning.
So that's one example of tarot mandala. So I ran another couple of decks. So I'm just going to shuffle this deck again. I'm going to pick another card. I'm going to do another mandala. Now, obviously, as I said before, you can actually add as many cards as you want to a mandala, regardless where they, they fit the crystal grid or the original the original crystal grid or not the crystal grid should be seen as a starting point and uh, a really good starting point with a um uh, with the keyword now let's have a look let's have a look i'm gonna pick a card courage with red jasper red jasper might be one of the dozen <laughs> one of the 12 or 13 crystals i actually know about and that's because I actually received it uh, um, as a gift uh, from someone in New Zealand. So that, that was actually uh, the reason why I, um, I read about it, because I received it as, as a gift. But let's have a look at what the uh, uh, book says about the Red Jasper and Courage. So it's number 34. So we've got Red Jasper, Courage Inside, Detoxification. That's interesting. Red Jasper, Selenite and Quartz. So there you go. We've got obviously one main at the center, and then these two. It feels almost as if it were an, uh, as above, so below, and past, and 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 you know past, present, and future. But you can see how this is already giving you an idea for a spread, for example, and a tarot mandala simply is. Uh, it's also a spread, but it's generally speaking, it's not a spread read for divination, but as you said before, or at least in what Rachel Pollux describes in her book, it's a way in which you can definitely start from a, let's say, not so positive reading and then, you know, turn it around in something that actually purifies the reading and manifests something positive. But let's have a look at what the guidebook says about courage. Red Jasper coupled with selenite is a very balanced combination because Red Jasper is a stone that works on the base chakra while selenite works on the higher chakras. Okay, so as before, it talks about Red Jasper as a stone of courage, stand up and be courageous. How the selenite looks like a sword, strength and valor are needed at this time. Ground yourself and ask for guidance from spirit. Trust that the insight you receive is exactly what you need right now and act with strength. Plant your feet firmly, strengthen your boundary and stand by your decision. It's also a powerful detoxifier. It works on the blood and circulatory system. And it might be time to discover a deeper self-sabotage pattern that are holding you from standing in your own power. We've done something like that before with that work. And so I feel like this one is um, best suited to, um, you know, focus indeed on courage and what do I need to stand up for and ground it and asking for guidance. So we've got one central stone as before. I think all of these start with the central stone. Now, the one that I'm going to show you, the tarot deck that I'm going to use for, uh, in this case, is the Zigzakana tarot deck. And uh, this is an indie production, is a deck made by an Australian. Um, it's But it's sold internationally from their Etsy uh, store. So I know that many of you already have this deck. Uh, I've actually seen it on Marine's channel, The Waves of Your Soul, and, you know, by looking at her videos a few times, that actually convinced me to get it, even though it was out of stock for a couple of time, for a couple of uh, months in Australia, but then it's now back in stock. It's a really beautiful deck. It's got these really vibrant, very saturated colors, and also, uh, let's say, uh, between brackets, there's a limited kind of color palette in the sense that it, it only has something like 12 I reckon a dozen colors, but they are very, very uh, saturated and they're also kind of at the opposite side of the color spectrum. So the contrast is very strong, as you can tell, and that makes for an attitude. It, it gives a personality to the deck and I really enjoy that. So at times it's a bit peepish, this deck. I noticed that the suit of ones is very peepish, it's not rather peep. Whereas the other uh, suits are still on the peepish side, but you always have a bit of an element. See, this is the two of ones and it's rather peep, but then you have ten of swords and it's almost as if it were scenic. Um, yeah, so that's, um, well, there you go, ten of ones again, rather peepish. 
um, and the seven of cups for example that is almost as if it were fully illustrated it's, it's a bit weird from that point of view but I don't mind I actually really like it so we are going to use this deck to create a Tara mandala out of the crystal uh, crystal grade uh, let's shuffle the deck first So as before, we're just going to put this on the side for a moment. I'm just going to pick a card. So at the center, I feel like we need to establish, we need to identify what do I need to focus my courage on. So it needs to identify the situation in which I need to show courage. Uh, I'd say it's a sword. So this person, it's not always me. So let's pretend that it's someone coming to me for a reading. So this person comes to me for a reading and I pull this card in this position. So the uh, position of this spread is where do you need to show courage? And so I'm going to tell her, look, this is about, this is a reflection of your thoughts. So the Ace of Swords is about um, something about a strategy, something about your thoughts, something you've been preparing, thinking and probably overthinking already in your mind. It's something that definitely is a situation that requires a lot of attention, a lot of focus from your side. But because um, this is the position in which it, it, it's encouraging you to show courage, it means that to start with, you probably did not show courage. You probably felt like this was overwhelming. You probably thought that this event, whatever this is, um, can be a bit daunting for you and perhaps you gave up or, or felt like you needed to give up. Now, how do we do this? So in this case, I also would probably read it reverse. What, how do we turn it around? And so we've got four elements as we see here. So let's have a look. Okay, we got the five, again, we can't really fit in here, but we got the five of pentacles. And we've got the nine of wands. We've got the four of cups. And everything is askew, sorry. And we've got the ten of cups. So this is a really um, very evocative reading. I think that in this case, there is a lack of courage because we are afraid of being left out in the cold. Perhaps our ideas feel to us like they won't be well accepted in the community or the project or the other people that are working with us, whether there's a cooperation in the, on the financial side of things, it doesn't matter, but there's a group that we feel will not accept our ideas and therefore these ideas of ours right now we are not even putting them forward because we're scared of being left out in the cold now this is a an encouragement to persist with that and i know that it feels as if we're taking everything onto ourselves and we're bruised and battered and we're just showing resilience at the last moment but we need to plow through we need to go ahead with this because otherwise, by not showing courage right now, by not uh, doing things uh, the way we think they need to be done, or at least speaking up, because we never know what the answers will be, um, and by, by shutting down, by repressing everything, we're actually living in a very restless kind of situation. I don't know if you can see the card, but this is the Four of Cups. So it's the epitome of being restless. We've been offered, we're looking down, we feel like we need something, but we're not necessarily reaching out for something that is given to us. Whatever we have is not enough. And we look up, but what's on offer is, is we're not sure about what's on offer. And that's because we're not speaking up. Look at all of this chagrin, all of this pain um, and restlessness because we're not speaking up. This is the way in which we, the cards or the mandala as well or the spread is telling us how to reverse an, an initially negative situation. Um, so let's remind ourselves that this is the main difference, I reckon, between a normal spread and a mandala type of spread with tarot. That you actually start from a negative kind of reading and you turn it around with the mandala, infusing it with positive meaning. So we want to believe that we will achieve that sense of belonging to the community, that sense of belonging in the family, in the relationship that has been growing. And has reached that kind of culmination on the soup on the suit of cups, which is the suit of feelings and emotion. So this is definitely a way in which if we 
push through, we overcome our fears of being left out in the cold and therefore overcome the, the kind of restlessness we've fallen into, we will reach that sense of community and do our part. And therefore, it's a way to turn around an initially negative kind of reading. And the last Tara Mandala that we are going to have a look at today, um, so the third one and last one, let's have another shuffle. It's a really, really big deck. So uh, compassion with uh, um, Agilite or Ahoite. I, I don't even know this um, crystal, so let me just pull it up. So it's either to be read in Spanish, ajoite, or, um, you know, if we read it the English way or ajoat, <laughs> perhaps it's to be read the French way. I honestly don't know. I never heard of this, but that's why we have the book. So number 29, but it's the keyword is compassion. Okay, so that's already something, at least compassion. I know what it is. 29. Compassion, high vibration communication. So, ah, there you go. Ahoite. Well, there you go. That's to be read the Spanish way. So, ahoite. Aquamarine and quartz. I know aquamarine because it's the color aquamarine. So, it's actually bluish. And quartz. Um, ahoite is a very high vibrational crystal. You may be in need of some guidance. Hmm. Especially if you are a light worker, use ahoite when you need to tap back into the source and seek answers and on a higher spiritual level. It elevates you to a realm where you can communicate freely with spirit, then aids you in communicating this information on the earth plane with compassion. That's really beautiful. I still have spirit communication. It is perfect for spiritual teachers. I love the way in which they present uh, the uh, energy related to this crystal. Really, really love it. It's the fact that we need to elevate ourselves to uh, communicate with free spirit, but then we need to go back down and, you know, and, and communicate back. And, and that's what I say all the time. When you're a tarot reader, you need to become a storyteller. You're an interpreter first, you speak many languages, you, you communicate with spirit, you communicate with the cards, you understand what the message is. But if you're not able to relate back in such a way that it's understood by the person you're reading for, then it's useless. What, what is even the point of you reading cards for others if you can't explain what the message is? It, you need to find a way to communicate for each and every person. There's a different way. There's not a way around that. I know this sounds very laborious, but it is what it is. <laughs> Having compassion for another means you have reached a level where you can see a situation for what it is. You see the bigger picture and all judgment has been removed from the situation. This is a sign of a true spiritual teacher. I love this card. Maybe you should buy this. Um, I wonder if it's difficult to source because I've never seen, never heard of it. So um, I really, really like this. So let's have a look. There's a lot of um, energy points here. Um, perhaps we should use, well, the central card, obviously, and then four, five, six, seven, eight. Perhaps we'll use eight, which is a more traditional uh, mandala. Let's have a look, though. So the next deck that I want to use, um, with the uh, crystal grid oracle is the pacific northwest tarot here it is and the reason why i want to use this deck is because i believe that there's a lot already of this kind of circling uh, images in uh, or symbols in the cards that uh, remind me a lot see that reminds me a lot of crystal grids but also mandalas so i don't mean all of the cards have it but there's a lot of cards that have that um, and I really like this idea. I also like the association of the colors. Um, this is, by the way, a fantastic deck. I think it's highly underrated because, I don't know, perhaps people, when you see it on camera, it gives you a certain bland kind of feel for it. But it's actually a really good reader. Very sharpshooter. Um, it is kind as well because you see the animal, so you think it's a hugger, but it's not because... Uh, a five of ones will be a five of ones and a you know a nine of 
if I find the nine of swords, it will be a nine of swords. So it's not necessarily showing things that are not there. Well, a nine of swords, a, a rattlesnake, I'll say. I never seen one. <laughs> I really don't miss it. <laughs> I've seen a lot of snakes in Australia. We don't have rattlesnakes in Australia, thank goodness. But we have everything else. <laughs> so we've got every single um, you know, poisonous insect and, and, and reptilian on the planet. Anyway, so I chose the Pacific Northwest. So let's give it a shuffle. So again, we set it aside like that so we need to talk about compassion but to me compassion is a step further to me ahoite for what i understand from the description on the book it looks as if it were the stone that um, puts you into communication with the spirit and also leads you or supports you when going back from the as above into the as below uh, so below, sorry, in order to, do, to be able to communicate. And that's where it asks you to feel compassion. Because if you don't feel compassion, you're putting people at a different level than yours. And if you are at a different level, you cannot communicate. You cannot effectively communicate. So you need to integrate. You need to find that way of looking at others without judgment. So I really like this idea. So where do I need to exercise compassion? Mm. Okay, now the sun to me, um, it's one of the very few cards that even when it's reversed is still a positive meaning. Um, it's, it's ju it just means that the uh, joy is delayed. However, I actually do see why it should be here. So let me explain my vision of the sun card, which is probably not popular. So please hold your guns, don't shoot the messenger or don't shoot anyone. <laughs> um, what I mean with the sun being, um, to me, that's a bit um, the joy you feel when it's uh, you're unaware. So it's like saying ignorance is bliss. It's like saying... Um, it, it also carries for me, um, so this is just personal, but it carries a bit of that uh, irresponsible sense of approaching things that people have when they don't realize what's at stake and they're just happy-go-lucky because they're selfish and they don't want to see that no one around them is happy-go-lucky like they are and there's chaos and pain and violence in the world and there's depression and anxiety and because they don't feel it they're also unaware of others and they're, they're not even paying attention to others so that to me is the blinding light of the sun so you are forced to see things or to not see things because of the blinding light of the sun and all you see is light and of course you think that that's a positive thing and you think it's fantastic and you bask in the sunlight you bask in the joy of the sunlight but on the other hand when the sun goes away and the card that comes next is actually judgment so judgment is the card that actually asks us to understand that what we've done has a consequence and we've been asked to take responsibility for it. So if it's like the tale of the, what is it, the ant and the cicada? I'm not sure, but in Italian it's an ant and a cicada. So the cicada parties the whole year and the ant works the whole year. And at the end of the year, you know, the cicada spent all of her money and has got nothing left, whereas the ant is exhausted. So the cicada is happy but broke and the ant is exhausted, exhausted but filthy rich. Neither one is happy, okay, and neither one is right. So I believe that the blinding light of the sun, or rather when the sun has reached a stage of happiness that is unaware of what's around you, it's not genuine anymore. That's my way of interpreting the sun card. You could have a completely different interpretation, and if you do, absolutely, and it's actually mm, interpreting the sun as the joy card is more RWSC than other uh, systems. So absolutely, it's more like my way of seeing the sun, perhaps because of, you know, um, 
I don't necessarily see everything as positive but that <laughs> I always think that it's positive but temporarily and we need to be aware um, because that's the only way for me to actually enjoy something positive to know that that's an ephemeral moment, it's, it's a fleeting moment, it's not something that is always being blinded by the sun or blinded by the light, otherwise I would not be able to recognize that there, there are moments of darkness. In any case, I don't want to get philosophical. That's my way of interpreting uh, my question. So my question originally was, where do I need to exercise compassion in order to be able to build this mandala around the ahoite? So in this case, the sun to me is reversed. As I said before, it's one of the very few cards in the tarot deck where even the reversed meaning is not negative, but in this case, it's a bit of a delay, perhaps. So my... Uh, let's say not so positive interpretation of the sun card in this in this case will be that you're being naive okay you think that everything is fine you think that everything is going well and nothing will ever happen to you because you're um you're perfect <laughs> and you need to exercise a compassion compassion to me in this case is more related to cum patire so cum patire is uh the the origin of the word com uh, compassion and it's latin cum means with and patire actually means um feel um so or suffer in some cases can also mean suffer so compassion cum patire is an encouragement to suffer with others so where do I do I need to feel this compassion? Because I'm not feeling it. I'm not aware of the others. My sun card like this means that I, I'm not even willing to consider that there's someone unlucky that you know I could eventually help. I'm just so focused on the light that is blinding me, that I feel like everything is going to be okay for myself, and I'm that's all I need. So I don't have compassion because i don't see others around me that's the way i read it so how do we exercise compassion how do we find our way towards compassion in order to be able to reverse this card and just being able to uh, feel the joy because absolutely go for it but be aware that there's others uh, that might not be in that situation so we said that we were going to look at eight cards. In this case, I'm just going to pull four first and then let's see if we need another four. Hmm, okay, we got the High Priestess. We got the Devil. The Ace of Wands. And Judgment. Okay, well, that's basically summarizing what I just said. It's basically making you aware you need to use your intuition in order to step back from that blinding light and see through everything, even the darkness of, represented by the devil, because perhaps there is vice around you. Perhaps there is destruction. Perhaps there is ego. So you need to go through that. Use your intuition to go see through that. You actually literally... These insects are, you know, eating the, the leaves of this plant and you can see through the leaves. So see through that with your intuition and start something again. But this time with the fiery energy that comes from um, taking advantage of all the experiences and the intuition that you should be able to exercise at this point in your life. And obviously, we talked about the fact that judgment comes after the sun card. So this this looks a lot like we've talked about uh, when introducing uh, the reason why I feel like the sun reversed actually ties back with the word compassion. If we then choose another four cards, hopefully they will fit. So we got the Ace of Cups, the Seven of Pentacles, the Five of Cups. And the Eight of Cups. Okay, so we've got a bit of work to do. Obviously, we've got three watery cards and one earthy card. Um, so this tells me that uh, we need to um, focus ourselves on our feelings, obviously. Perhaps this Ace of Wands goes in parallel with the Ace of Cups, although let's not forget that fire does not necessarily combine or match uh, with water they're kind of the opposite so in, from an alchemical point of view there is a little bit of contrast here 
So we need to take advantage of this and coexist and have them coexist. That may require a little bit of effort. So when we're starting something new, we still need that kind of energy that is propelling us forward thanks to the power of the fire. But we need to not forget um, our compassion, again, our compassion with our feelings. The seven of pentacles always refers back to the fact that we need to be humble and admit that even though we have done so much, we have reached that level in which we need to look around ourselves and decide whether we need to perhaps reassess the situation, we need to um, see whether the path we have been taking is the right one or not, and also be humble enough to say, okay, perhaps we were wrong and perhaps we need to start again. The Five of Cups is accepting the loss as for what it is, okay? Because to me, the Five of Cups is every time this crying over spilled milk. Of course, you've got a couple of cups that uh, fell down, they're broken, they spilled their content, but you still have a couple of cups that are still up. So, and there's people that don't have any cups at all. And this is, again, the way in which we need to exercise that kind of compassion. Yes, perhaps we are going something through something difficult, but let's exercise compassion towards ourselves and also towards others and always focus on the cups that are still upright because you still have them and guess what you still have to take care of them and finally we got an eight of cups so the eight of cups in this case to me it's not just the move the moving away it's more like the moving on um, you move on from a situation that did not serve you and you are changing something about yourself so it's basically you don't stay in the location you're in because that location that spot that place knows you um, for one type of person you need to go somewhere else when they don't know you and you can start something again so this is telling me that in order to turn around the sun card and apply compassion, I need to be aware of others. I need to admit that sometimes I'm wrong. I need to use my own intuition in order to be able to, to see through all the intricacies of the distraction that I've got around myself. Start a new, perhaps with renewed energy, but never forgetting about using that compassion that always needs to, to be with me. Use compassion whenever even I myself am going through something difficult. And also perhaps just, you know, go somewhere else, exercise this somewhere else. Because it is, sometimes it is the case that, that it, I, again, I'm quoting that poem from Rilke, because there is no place in this life where that doesn't know you, you have to change your life. So this is the Eight of Cups for me. Um, where you are right now they know you like this so if you want to change perhaps you also need to change environment and it doesn't necessarily mean physically but you need to start again with a completely new life with a completely new attitude with a completely new um, intention and to, in order to manifest something different so this was it um, as we looked uh, through this deck the crystal grid oracle we I uh, also had a possibility to learn uh, how to make a tarot mandala and in specific with the intention of turning a not so positive reading into something positive, uh, which is a very soothing kind of practice. It's not a practice for divination, but it is a practice for bonding, for example, with one of your decks. I really, really like this, these, these decks that I've shown you today. And um, yeah, let me know what you think if you have this crystal grid um, deck. How do you use it? Do you do the exercises that is explained on the book? Or do you have actual crystal and do you, do you actually make crystal grids? That would be very interesting for me um, to know. So thank you so much for staying with me till the end of this video. More to come. Have a great day.